the time 1840 rolled around, the country was in such a deep depression that it would have been obvious to all observers that Van Buren was bound to lose, that the Whigs could have run anybody and beaten Van Buren. And if they had known that, the Whigs would have run Clay. But instead of nominating Henry Clay for president, the new Whig party chose William Henry Harrison because they believed he was the candidate who most resembled Andrew Jackson. Harrison had been a frontier general and an Indian fighter. But more importantly, he supported the rechartering of the Bank of the United States. The election of 1840 was a flamboyant affair, the first presidential campaign to feature open public rallies, songs, and slogans. They were all out in the cider barrel when Van Buren's people would start to speak, as well as uh, the image of the log cabin, and with chants of, Van, Van, he's a used up man. They call it Van Buren, Martin Van Ruin. In contrast, William Henry Harrison was touted by his old war nickname, which he got while fighting Indians at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe and Tyler too was the slogan. John Tyler, of course, was Harrison's running mate. One of the great symbols of the campaign of 1840 is the log cabin. William Henry Harrison wasn't born in a log cabin, but nonetheless, this becomes sort of the enduring symbol of that campaign. And another symbol that the uh, Whigs manipulate very successfully is the image of the English coach that Martin Van Buren allegedly rides in. And the Harrison supporters like to sing, in English coaches, he's no rider, but he can fight and drink hard cider. Harrison took his lumps from the Van Buren camp as well. More than anything, they attacked his age. People accused him of being too old and of being a sort of phony Jackson, a phony general. They even called him a granny general. But ultimately, it was the economy that decided the election. Number nine, William Henry Harrison, Whig. March 4th to April 4th, 1841. 68 years old, from Ohio. Poor Harrison felt it necessary to give a very long and learned inaugural address, probably because in the campaign it had been suggested that he was a simple homespun guy. Harrison decided that as a president he needed a different image. Contrary to his campaign image, Harrison was hardly a backcountry bumpkin. He was an aristocrat had a college education, and was the only president to study medicine. In taking the oath of office, Harrison wanted to remind people of his true background and dispel any adverse thoughts about his age. So he gave the longest inaugural address in American history, nearly two hours. He insisted on speaking on a cold March day uh, with no hat or overcoat, and uh, somehow he caught a cold, and the cold turned to pneumonia. And in the end, the uh, poor man died. Just 31 days into his administration, William Henry Harrison became the first U.S. president to die in office. Vice President John Tyler was playing marbles at his home in Virginia when he learned of Harrison's death. He immediately went to Washington to assume the presidency. But there was no clear constitutional guideline for succession. That set the stage for another epic battle in American political history. After becoming president, John Tyler refused to name a vice president. He served his entire term without one. 